important discussion on monetary policy as an engine of economic growth. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a bit oxymoronish to talk about monetary policy as an engine of economic growth, but we'll come to that a little later. And I, you know, I had the opportunity to talk to some of the panelists here and uh, got some very interesting, uh, interesting views on uh, what monetary policy can do and what central banks can do and all that. Uh, but first, we'd like to go across to New York, where Dr. Viral Acharya is waiting for us. And, uh, you know, as you know, it's uh, past midnight in New York, and uh, we'd like to start with him and ask him a few questions. And he has to obviously leave the stage a little early. But if I could start with you, Dr. Acharya, can you hear us, sir? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you very well. Uh, Dr. Acharya, thank okay. you. Thank you very much for taking the time out and, uh, you know, staying up so late and uh, for, for this panel discussion. If I could just start, you know, you know in a broad economic, in a broad, talking about a broad economic uh, uh, point, since the global financial crisis, how do you think the role of the central banks has really changed? Has it fundamentally altered from what it was in the past? And are we really looking at a very, very different, different role that central banks will play uh, from now on going forward? Dr. Acharya. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, thank you, Sridhar. Uh, at the outset, uh, just my good afternoon to everyone in the audience. It's nice to be speaking to an Indian audience after a good break of about three months. Uh, I should also mention that I'm on a self-imposed cooling period of one year, so my remarks are more about monetary policy in general, and uh, they don't have uh, necessarily any specific slant or implications for India. Uh, of course, I think economics lies the same way in most parts of the world, and some of this may be applicable to India. Uh, I think coming to your question, uh, my sense is that monetary policy was supposed to function as it did earlier, uh, which is that when there are cyclical shocks, uh, monetary policy is supposed to counter-cyclically adjust to them. Um, uh, unfortunately, the global financial crisis was a big shock uh, in the sense of affecting the financial stability of uh, many big financial sectors in the developed economies. Uh, and what has happened as a result is that in some countries such as the United States, uh, uh, complementary measures to monetary policy were undertaken, such as a uh, very significant recapitalization of the financial sector, uh, reforms, especially on bank capital rooms. Uh, and the sum total of all that was that while the monetary policy was accommodating, uh, cutting rates uh, all the way to zero, doing quantitative easing, you know, doing yield curve management for the government and perhaps even the mortgage yield curve. Uh, simultaneously, the financial sector was being restored at a fairly uh, frantic pace, I would say. Uh, and so the monetary policy, in my view, has returned to normalcy at least after a significant period of seven, eight years uh, in the United States. Uh, in contrast, in some other parts of the world, such as Europe and Japan, this has not been the case. Uh, monetary policy has, uh, is being used to pursue objectives that it was not meant to be pursuing, uh, such as uh, either saving the currency or substituting for financial stability by doing much of the heavy lifting. Uh, as a result, uh, at least the research so far tends to show that the efficacy of monetary policy in these countries has not been that great. Uh, and I want to stress this point a bit, which is that the financial stability is a prerequisite for monetary policy to get transmitted to the real economy. Uh, if you don't have a stable, well-capitalized financial sector, uh, you don't get lending and intermediation to get transmitted from the monetary policy at the right rates uh, to the real sector of and I, I say, I want to stress this because uh, it's become somewhat Pavlovian to ask monetary policy to adjust when inflation is below target or growth is slowing down. But no one, in my view, should be operating monetary policy or asking for monetary policy to adjust without a clear understanding of the channels through which monetary policy actions are going to transmit the economy. Because if it's going to get stuck at the intermediation point, um, then you've got to ask the question, can you really accommodate to benefit the financial sector for five years at the stretch? 
without any transmission to the real economy. Uh, if you are doing yield curve management for the government, can you continue to monetize the fiscal deficits of the government uh, or maybe even solvency concerns of the governments as in Europe, as in some uh, countries in Europe? And uh, as a result, what has happened, in my opinion, over the last 10 years is that objectives, the intended functions, the expectations of monetary policy transmission have become a shifting target. I sometimes jokingly refer to it as, you start out somewhere, the arrow is going somewhere else, then you start saying, no, that is exactly where I have it. Uh, or you say maybe it's going to get deflected over a period of time. And I think uh, my, my, I'm deeply concerned actually with the way monetary policy is operating in many parts of the world because uh, it is shifting away from its mandate. It's not answering the tough question of how it's going to transmit the real economy to achieve whatever mandate has been given to it. And I think as a result, uh, it's, it's perhaps uh, a little bit all over the place in different parts. Right. I'll stop there. Right. That's, that's a very interesting point that you made, Kahim Pe Nigahe, Kahim Pe Nishana. Uh, the former uh, RBI governor, Dr. Agram Rajan, had made this point many, many years ago that uh, monetary policy and central bankers especially uh, are in danger of becoming the only game in town. That if they continue to pursue these unconventional monetary policies and the market continues to think that the central bankers are the only ones who can actually save them. Uh, do you think, given the fact that uh, the global financial crisis is well, you know, behind us now, it's been more than 10 years, uh, what is the rationale or the need to continue with these kind of policies? And we're continuing to see it in many countries, I mean, not just in Japan, in Europe, and even in the United States. Uh, and we're not even talking about the amount of trillions of dollars that is there earning little or nothing, actually negative rates. Uh, now I'll come to that second point a little later. but. Uh, what is the need for, do you, think, do you think it's time for central bankers now to kind of step back and say, look, we've done whatever we had to do. Now, uh, Mr. Politician, now the ball is in your court. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that's sort of my view. And uh, if I was the central banker, I would be, I would be quite upfront, as you have put it. Uh, uh, but I, I no longer am, and I understand the political reality of, some of these conversations. But I think I want to get back to my point about transmission, which is that uh, if the transmission to the real economy is not happening after 10 years of accommodation, uh, this is true in many parts of the world right. right now. There are two ways to go. Some central bankers are taking the path saying, listen, it'll happen at some point. So I'm going to keep on going down this path. Uh, in some recent stuff I've done, I've been referring to it as a cul-de-sac, which is you're just driving down a path where you know you're hitting a dead end, but they seem to be wanting to continue down that path. Uh, I think an alternative, a more pragmatic approach uh, would be to actually be upfront and recognize that the monetary policy can only do so much if financial stability is not restored, if solvency conditions of sovereign balance sheets is not restored, if fiscal deficits are not reined in, we can't get transmission to the long end of the yield curve. If these conversations are not held directly by the central bank, and I think it needs to be held publicly because right. both the expectations of markets, the conversation from the markets to the other uh, regulators, they could be financial stability regulators, it could be the governments, those conversations also have to take place directly. Uh, monetary policy is not meant to address structural problems of the economy. In, in traditional macroeconomic theory, monetary policy adjusts for cyclical shocks, and that's all it can really be expected to achieve. Other policies have to do their job in, co in, in a complementary manner. So I think the conversation I would like the central bankers in the world to have is not to say, I will do whatever it takes. I think that's the wrong approach because you can't, you can't solve structural problems of right. the economy with an right. interest rate or the balance sheet of the government. Uh, I think the, I would like them to basically say, listen, I can buy your time. I can, I can accommodate uh, when inflation is below target, when growth is uh, not up to expectations or not up to the potential levels. But if these other complementary measures are not undertaken, then I'm buying you time. Listen, it's not going to work the way you want 
the monetary policy to curb. And so either I'll have to pull back or we work in tandem. I think that game of chicken, if you want, has to happen in the conversations between the central banks and other complementary regulators and governments. If they don't, I think I agree with Raghuram Rajan that central banks will be left to be the only game in town because they are relaxing the pedal on everyone else to undertake any reforms. The moment you accommodate for another one quarter, two quarters, three quarters, equity investors will be delighted. The, the firms can borrow cheap. They can alter their maturities to borrow at the short end if the long end is not uh, getting affected. It's a, it's a free transfer from the savers in the economy to borrowers in the economy or whoever has capital that can get financialized. But if it's not translating into jobs, it's not translating into growth, I think this is just a wasteful monetary policy because it's going to make precisely the starting problems of lack of wage growth, the lack of the income inequality, lack of right distribution outcomes, which are all hindrances in growth uh, generating capacity of the economy itself. Monetary policy will just end up perpetuating them, and I think it is perpetuating them. In many that's parts that's what seems to be happening. Thank you, Dr. Acharya. Just one last point before yeah. before before we yeah. let you go. Uh, you mentioned about structural problems, but there is also one big issue among central bankers around the world, which is on inflation. Uh, do you think they have spectacularly misread inflation? Uh, I think uh, you know spectacular is. Uh, uh, is, a, is a very sure. objective term. Uh, I, I mean to say it's a very subjective term. I think objectively speaking, they have undershot, uh, the forecasts have undershot their achievement. Uh, and I think this is deeply rooted in the problems I was referring to in my view, which is that um, if, you, if you don't have the economy structurally right, if financial sectors are not stable, uh, if government finances are not stable, uh, then monetary policy is not expected to transmit into right. fixing the slack in the economy as rapidly as you would think it is to be. So in Europe and Japan, for example, monetary policy has funded what I like to call as zombie firms, where banks, in order to right. uh, keep their capital positions, don't take losses on deep distressed assets. Instead, they keep rolling them over hoping that the central bank will keep throwing cheap liquidity at them, either through rates or through quantitative easing. Uh, in in US uh, right now, uh, you know, the level of junk bond issuance uh, it has peaked. Uh, my colleague at Altman at NYU Stern, based on his methodology, finds that about a, a third of firms which are at the cusp of the investment grade are actually not investment grade. They should actually be downgraded so there's probably some ratings inflation going on uh, in these bond markets because you know they've gotten used to the steroid of low interest rates and no one wants to, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, call it out. Um, and so uh, if you have this uh, slack remaining in the economy because the firms that should actually exit are not over a period of time exiting, you get excess capacity in markets. If you have excess capacity in markets, the economy remains unproductive because inefficient firms are not exiting. Uh, what that does is it brings the potential growth of the economy down. Uh, your statistical models don't work anymore because uh, your, your long run averages are based on a healthy set of firms operating in the economy, but monetary policy is subsidizing zombies to proliferate. Uh, and because of the slack not going down, because of there being excess capacity, you get sort of depressed prices. Uh, now, of course, there are other channels through which this works perversely. If the wrong firms are in the market, uh, then, you know, the wages don't rise because the investments are not taking place. Uh, and therefore, good right. productive capacity is not being created for the right jobs. So, uh, I, I would, uh, I think my... Uh, the, the viewpoint I would like to offer is that rather than saying you got inflation right or wrong, right. I think the question to ask the central bankers is, did your monetary policy transmit to the parts of the economy where you think it should have transmitted? I think if you answer that question, if you get them to answer that question, you will automatically see why they actually did or did not get their inflation predictions right, why they were or were not able to get growth to be restored to the right level. Because maybe actually through their own action uh, and not being able to get governments and financial stability regulators along, uh, 
uh, they've actually produced uh, structurally an economy which is very different from what the steady state economy and inflation and growth forecasts are likely to be. Right. Let me stop there. Absolutely, absolutely. And some of those points, I think, are still yet to be answered in the case of India. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Acharya. Thank you for staying up and giving us your incisive thoughts on these issues. It's a very important subject, and I'm sure we'll keep, we'll keep uh, you know, we'll discuss it on the panel as well, and probably we'll keep coming back on many, uh, over the next few months or years on, because this subject, this topic is probably not going to go away. It's going to stay with us if you look at what's happening in the U.S. and uh, Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Acharya. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand to Dr. Thank Acharya. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, and uh, Thank you. good luck to the panelists. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Jamal, uh, you. maybe I could like, I'd like to start with you. I mean, you had some thoughts on the role of central banks and monetary policy as an effective instrument of economic growth. Well, uh, okay. Well, thank you for you know, asking me, responding to my request that I should come up early in the panel. No, no problem. Uh, you know, I'm the only non-economist here, and I have a thought, an idea, which I think is so obvious to me, but I haven't heard anybody else speak it. So perhaps it is wrong. Or per I think you need oh, to sorry. hold it a little. Close it, close it, close it. It's not even on. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Now, just quickly, I'm the only non-economist, and I have an idea which, to me, makes a lot of sense, but everyone else may find very strange. Uh, so let me just barrel on with it, because it's the only thing that makes sense to me. Now, as Virgil just said, you know, I mean, clearly the global economy is in a mess, right? There is suboptimal, very low growth. There is effectively no inflation. There is huge and widening inequality, which has created a lot of political problems, amongst other things. And what I would call the elephant in the room is there is more than $15 trillion of capital bonds, which, is, uh, which are earning negative interest rates, right? And this is money which is being managed by professionals. So, you know, so if, if I were a doctor, you know, those would be the symptoms I would, I would list, you know. And looking at that, to me, a very simple diagnosis is that there is too much capital in the world, right? I think it's obvious. You talk to any private equity investor, there's too much capital in the world. Two days ago, somebody, an investor, was talking to me. He's just come back from China, where they are talking not just about unicorns, but about decacorns, which means yes. companies with a 10 billion market cap. Startups, right? right? I mean, it's nuts. There is too much capital in the world. But why is there too much capital in the world? And this is where I think I will, let's say I might be in a majority of one. I think there is too much capital in the world because for 40 years, approximately, capital has been given a free ride from a taxation standpoint. It has always been seen as, you know, the princess in the, in the tower, if you will. You know, you don't tax capital, or you tax it very little. And if you do that over 40 years, plus, of course, that's aided and abetted by a huge evolution of an industry called tax avoidance. So as a result of that, I believe this is the reason why we have so much capital in the world that people don't know what to do. Monetary policy doesn't work. Um, you know, people are throwing money at, at uh, 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 you know, companies that should not get money. And basically what's happening, the inequality is rising because people with wealth are able to play the curve just as Virel said, and it keeps widening. It has been going on for a long time, right? In point of fact, you know, the first hint of this came out about 20 years ago during the dot-com crisis when people were talking about burning capital. I mean, before that, you know, you preserved capital. You couldn't even dream of burning capital. So I'm saying 20 years ago, there was already too much capital in the world, and it's gotten worse. Okay, so this is the prescription. Now, what is the solution? And again, I say I'm no economist, but I feel what I'm about to, what I'm suggesting makes perfect sense, right? As it lets you remember, we have no growth, no inflation, huge uh, 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 inequality, and uh, money that, capital that's earning no return, negative return. So here is my solution. It's the first step 
we will eliminate all income taxes, all taxes on individuals, on corporates, all indirect taxes. The only income taxes that will be levied will be on senior executives who are making more than, let's say, 200 times the minimum salary, right? So let us say there is a corporate executive who's making $20 million, right? Two, one, 200, that would be 100,000. The minimum salary will have to be $100,000, right? Now that won't really be a problem because now let's remember the corporate is not paying any taxes either. So he could keep his 20 million. The lower paid people will get more money, which they will obviously spend. Right? Now if you do this whole equation with global uh, uh, tax rates, they would release between 20 and $25 trillion a year of money to individuals and companies. So what would they do? Well, they'd spend, they'd save, they'd invest. What would be the result of that? Growth, remember? We need growth. Now you will only get growth if people spend. Uh, so you put the money in their hands. Jamal, there's a small point about the whole in government finances. Yes. So but how are you going to fix that, right? Oh, the, if the government don't get any tax revenues, what are they going to do? Well, it's very simple, as I said at the very beginning. The idea was that capital has not been taxed adequately. So you make this 20 trillion or 25 trillion dollars up from taxing capital and capital-based income. Now, there's of course capital gains, dividends, interest on bonds, but that's peanuts. The real capital asset that should be taxed is real estate. I don't want, you know, we need, I don't want to labor too much time on it, but if you do the arithmetic, uh, just from, and the data is a little fuzzy, but the total value, there's, there's 100 billion uh, square, square meters of real estate, built up real estate in New York. Now if you say 75% of that is owner occupied, okay, I'm not gonna tax that. Just take the balance, multiply it out by the uh, uh, you know, median price of real estate in New York, you get the value of taxable real estate in New York City alone at 50 trillion. And these are huge, insane numbers. Now, if you multiply that across the world, you'd probably come to something like 2,000 trillion. How much do you need? 25 trillion, 1%. So I'm saying you, you'd have no tax on labor, if you want to call it that, and you have tax only on capital. And the reason for that is because for years, capital has been undertaxed. Last point, I'll let sure. it go. Of course, asset prices will come down. Real estate prices will come down, equity prices will come down. But I think that's good, because the reality is today, most people cannot afford to buy houses. And the re other reality is people will have money, so when the prices come down sufficiently, there will be an equilibrium where the assets would go up again. So like I said, it's a somewhat radical idea. Let me leave it there and let's get some thoughts. No, no, no problem. Thank you. Ashima, uh, we had two very interesting conversations so far. I mean, Jamal talking about the excess capital and Dr. Viral Acharya basically saying that, look, you have a lot of structural problems there out in the economy. How do you expect central bankers on monetary policy to fix all those? What do you think? I mean, we've had monetary policy experiment after... Sorry, we had monetary policy experiment after experiment in the last 10 years. Uh, has it really gotten us anywhere? Yeah, I think I'll start with Jamal's idea Please. since they're most immediate. I, it would, you know, you, your, your plan is wonderful if it could be implemented, but it requires an amazing amount of coordination. Every nation has to agree to tax its real estate. And the main reason why capital is undertaxed is it's mobile. It, it flies away from a country where it's, where it's taxed. So, I think the globe as a whole is achieving some degree of coordination, less than what is required for your scheme, because people are very, countries are very passionate about their right to tax. They should decide their tax rates, not the globe, right? But companies that are mobile, that are able to go to tax havens and avoid taxation. So I think the G20 and the OECD, their uh, base erosion and profit evasion scheme is really going places. And it's reaching an agreement where firms will have to pay taxes based on their revenue, not the profit. Because like Mark was saying, it's very easy to fudge those numbers. 
So whatever the contribution, what you're earning in a country, you will pay based on that. And I think that should make a big difference to taxing capital. So, you know, <laughs> if I may just right. respond to that, I agree sure. with you that tax mm -hmm. evasion is one of the biggest issues. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that my main point is that if, is, the, is my diagnosis right? That the mm -hmm. problem of the world today is created by a lack of taxation on capital. Right, that is true, and the reason is the mobility of capital, right? And so you, you have to tackle that. They, they should not be able to escape taxes by moving to another country, right? So I agree with that diagnosis. It may not be the only problem, but it's one big problem. <laughs> now you, coming you, to Viraj. Sure. Uh, do you agree with this view that a monetary policy uh, followed by central bankers worldwide has, they've got themselves into some kind of a cul-de-sac. Uh, they don't know how to get out. Uh, yes, I, but, I, but I think you have to look at where it started with the great financial crisis. Right. And if you look at the country that implemented this first, this quantitative easing one, we have seen that the crisis originated in the US and they were the ones who were able to get out of it. Like Viral was saying, they're the only country which has, in, in the West, the advanced economies, which has normalized monetary policy. They actually have a positive real interest rate, not a negative interest rate like Europe or Japan and right, so on. And right. they were the ones who acted quickly. So I think that it does work in certain circumstances. And it has, been, it has gone on for too long. There's, it's easier to, do, to cut rates than it is to, uh, for parliaments to pass spending plans. But it's recognized worldwide that in this low interest environment, government spending has been too little. But then again, the problem of governments not being able to tax capital and therefore having to borrow that is the issue. Parliaments right. won't pass debt relaxation rules, etc. So it's very difficult to coordinate all that. So then monetary policy is actually the only person who can do something. And like Bernanke used to say, you're, you're that time, I remember the analysis, I think Eichen Green had a graph which showed a lot of uh, diagnostic graphs going like this and then just like that, you know, absolutely down. So you were heading for another great recession. And I think the policies followed QE right. and cut to zero rates and so on really did save the U.S. Now, the problem I have with Viral's analysis is that in, in, um, in standard times, it's true. Monetary policy should just focus on counter-cyclical around some steady state, which is driven by the real economy. But in non-standard times, a major objective of the central bank is the le lender of the last resort. Financial stability comes not only from regulations right. and regulatory right. actions, but also from providing liquidity. You are the sole provider of liquidity. When markets freeze, as they did in the US, you know, and uh, then asset values, their fire sales and asset values are just sinking. So what is an illiquid situation quickly becomes insolvency. Right. Right. So then they have to step in and save. So now when someone like Raghuram or Viral comes from the US or, or from Europe or from studying Europe where monetary policy has been overutilized and apply that in India, then it can go very wrong. Because I think if you have to compare India's situation today, it should not be with Europe today, but say right. with the US in 2008, because we are seeing something of a market freeze. If you see our, our data, there's such a sharp fall in credit right. the last That's six right. months. It's because uh, uh, for whatever reason, um, the financial sector, the, you know, if, if it was true that by abstaining, keeping monetary policy tight, you force governments to solve structural problems and the financial markets start working perfectly. The last 10 years, since 2011, India has been following very, very tight monetary policy. Financial markets should be working perfectly. But they are in very bad shape here. They're not right. providing Absolutely. credit at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it could be when the rest of the world, I think Mark made this point, had negative interest rates. For our firms, the real interest rate was something like 12% because the CPI was high, but producer prices were very low, negative. And how can you do productive investment with such high costs? With, high, with such yeah. high rates. Yeah. Right. Uh, real, if I could come to you, uh, mm. we've had RBI cutting rates over the last, say, one year or so. We've had liquidity now coming back into the system. But you still have very, very poor credit flow. I mean, as Ashima was saying, credit seems to have just fallen off a cliff. It's probably better than what it was in October last year, but it's still very bad. Uh, transmission, central bank acting too late, too little. What do you think are the reasons? 
Uh, I will say that, you know, uh, the problems we face today had their genesis in the liquidity crunch of last year. Right. Both in terms of, you know, the RBI hiking rates and not providing liquidity. Now, things started turning uh, somewhere around December. Uh, and, and, of course, the first rate cut was in February. Now, I think there are two, three things here. Number one, when the RBI puts in one rupee of primary liquidity, it takes at least six to nine months for that to convert into, uh, let's say, six, five rupees of bank loans or you know, seven rupees of money supply. That gestation lag, I think, got uh, further elongated by the fact that we had elections, and that led to a drawl of cash. So it's really somewhere around June that you've seen that process starting. So you know, clearly a lot more time to go before the RBI's measures take, take uh, bear fruit. So that's one. The second thing that has happened is a collapse of commodity prices, a collapse of the WPI inflation. WPI inflation is down almost 250 basis points. So as a result, you know, what has happened is that your real lending rates have actually shot up, despite RBI easing. So if you see the MCLR, the MCLR is down 40 basis points. But if you adjust it with core WPI, that's up 120 basis points. The average lending rate has actually not come down. It is up eight basis points. And therefore, uh, you know, the uh, real average lending rate is almost up 200 basis points. So given that you had these two shocks, you know, the collapse of commodity prices on the one hand and, and the elections on the other, I think that it will take at least three to six months more for the RBI's measures to, to pan out. So I think that, you know, maybe at some stage, the RBI will have to think of direct measures to bring down the average lending rate. It could be a CRR cut, it could be a subvention for the SME sector, but you know, there is clearly a, uh, you know, a longer uh, period. So you think the rate cuts are not helping? Not rate helping cuts enough? are helping, but they need their time to bear fruit. Right. Right. Samiran, I should have come to you, and I'm sorry for this delay in uh, bringing you up here. What do you think is, is really happening with the central bank uh, formulating monetary policy and acting as a real engine of growth? Do you think, do you think that's still valid in current circumstances? Or like, as Dr. Viralacharya said, they should now just pull back and let the governments do their bit? Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Acharya and Dr. Goel, uh, they had somewhat of an opposing uh, view from a very long-term right. effectiveness of monetary policy perspective. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and the big question was that what is the Japan story versus the what is the India story could be very different. Right. So let me stick to something which is less controversial, which is what monetary policy is supposed to do. Is it even doing that? And. That's a question of whether the rate cut that RBI is doing is at all getting translated into lower lending rates or general rates in the economy. So we look at three different parts to it. One is the RBI rate versus, say, a one-year government security rate. Then you can have a term premium on top of it between the one-year rate versus the 10-year rate. And then you can have a right. spread which is between the sovereign versus the corporate bond. And what we see is that the so-called real policy rate itself is second highest for India in Asia currently. And if you look at the term premium, the term premium is almost 50, 60 basis points more than what the last six years average has been. The only area where we are seeing some improvement coming is that the corporate spreads have started narrowing down a bit, which is, I would connect that more to uh, sort of sentiment improving measures taken by the government and less connected to the monetary policy side of it. So this is where the struggle is that the rate cut itself is not getting translated. And on top of it, we have a peculiar problem which Inel was referring to, which is a problem of the supply of credit. Right. This is only the cost of credit. On the supply of credit side, we are seeing this very interesting phenomenon that 
the RBI is creating money at 15% year-over-year growth, but the actual money supply in the economy is growing only at 10%. Right. And this is an area which, in my view, one solution is a CRR cut sort of thing, which will drive up the money supply growth also. But I think what is, and this is true globally, that it's connected to sentiment. So it's like RBI is putting up a tap, but there is the pump in the financial system which gives leverage to this money. That pump is not working. And that pump will work only when you will have enough confidence in the system uh, and, and that's when both the engines will function, that you will have both lower rates as well as availability of credit improving. That's when monetary policy can be effective. Sorry, but when you talk about the pump in the system and you talk about the sentiment part of it, how much of a role can RBI or any central bank really play? Because if you talk to any bankers, and I'm sure all of you keep speaking to bankers on a regular basis, you speak to any banker, uh, there, is, there is a genuine fear of lending to certain sectors. There is a genuine fear of lending to probably industry as such. I mean, there are some of the biggest banks saying that we want to push up retail credit to a particular level, 60 or 70 percent. Uh, how, does, how does one solve this? I mean, maybe I can ask any of the panelists to respond. Maybe Samaran can have yeah, a go at it first I'll and the others can follow. Sure. 30 second response. I think there are no easy answers here. Uh, the, but the thing is that in any cyclical downturn, you will have uh, sort of risk appetite reducing. Going off, yeah. But the fact that you have two and a half, three trillion rupees of excess liquidity in the system, at some point of time, will have to flow into the economy. Uh, it's difficult for us to take a call on whether it's going to be three months, six months, but I can't believe that a bank will keep on parking this as 4.9% in RBI forever, where there's an right. opportunity to lend at 12%. Right, right. Ashima, sense. Ashima, your views? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, that uh, you have a credit risk and a term premium risk, both of which are elevated in India. So uh, this this issue, we made a big mistake last year in the sense that durable liquidity was very tight as well as the LAF because of outflows and, and just at a time when the NBFC crisis, that means sectoral liquidity. So, so I, and this liquidity drought continued for very, very many months, much longer than it ever had. And so it really killed consumption. I think the NBFCs were financing a lot of people who were excluded. And we've seen the outcome in terms of growth falling, et cetera. And then there are worries about these fire sales, that when you know, the asset values decrease, then bankers are worried that, uh, and they are not willing to lend. So that confidence has to return, that credit risk. And I think the government has taken a number of measures. We're seeing signs that things are bottoming out, even in the housing market. There's some improvement. Slowly it will percolate. Like Samiran was saying, if banks, the option is you have huge excess liquidity now, and you're getting very low interest rates. You have to pay those depositors, you have to earn. So it's some, there is an incentive for them to go out and find people to lend to. But the second, this term premium, that is also higher than it has ever been. And this is related to our whole, our dilemmas about the fiscal deficit. For some reason, we think government borrowing is too high, markets think. And, you know, coming back to the parallel with global monetary policy, what did the US do in Q, QE1? They bought U.S. government securities. The, the Fed, Fed right. did that. And in India, uh, the, the RBI did a lot of this for, you know, after the big drought when they were building up durable liquidity. But recently they announced that they're going to use FX swaps or whatever. And we're seeing a lot of inflows. So then the central bank, you're getting, again, foreign securities, but you're not buying local government securities. And I think this we need to think about, because if there is a parallel between India today and markets freezing and term premiums being elevated, then the part of transmission is to get those term premiums back to the normal 60 basis points. And I think an announcement of open market operations, that's one way that that transmission can improve also. So, right. Uh, hmm. Interdeal? Sorry, Jamal. Yeah. I think another issue that you, is basically investment sentiment. I mean, we're right. talking here about the supply side of credit, you know. Yeah. But ultimately, I think basically in the country today, investment sentiment is quite negative. So, okay, there are difficult borrowers, but there are good borrowers who are not borrowing, you know. People are investing overseas rather than locally because they're really not sure right. as to what, you know, let's say very uncomfortable about what the future holds. I think that's another 
element in the pot. But that's something that the government can probably do, and it's probably Absolutely. doing Absolutely. I understand yeah. that. I'm just saying yeah. that is another issue today, you know. Right, right. Indranil, your uh, views I just on wanted to, you know, say that there's another committee where Dr. Goel and I sit, and a point she made that, you know, in a war you don't give up. So, you know, uh, this is, uh, you know, you, you are seeing the RBI cut rates, provide liquidity. The government, I think, is taking a measure after measure. Uh, but then they all need six to nine months to pan out. So uh, we have to put up with some more pain. And, you know, as, uh, as you probably the RBI cuts somewhat more, uh, I think they're fairly on course on the durable liquidity side. You will see uh, slowly, you know, interest rates come down and the transmission happen. But it can't happen overnight. Yes, you know, when people say that M3 is not growing, even though reserve money, M, M, MO is growing, and therefore MO should not grow, that is absolutely the wrong analysis. Because if M3 is not growing, you need to expand the central bank balance sheet, grow M, MO more to compensate, so that uh, at least the, the money supply growth is equal to that of nominal income. No? Right, absolutely. And because the other important point is that inflation is contained. The long period we were fighting inflation, though a lot of people believe inflation is overestimated now. You know, Mark was making this point again, the digital economy, actual inflation is much lower. Than, and worldwide inflation is so low, that's going to affect India also, which is yeah, increasing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's an so uh, then, in, yeah. even under inflation targeting, you have room to cut rates. So you should not say that monetary policy is not working, and therefore we will stop cutting rates. When, it, as an inflation targeter, your real rates are too high. Right. It's, it's interesting that you're bringing this up. You know, Dr. Viralachary also uh, pointed to that. Uh, have, have the central banks really misread inflation? Or is it just a case of technology just galloping ahead so fast that, you know, the real world is probably just trying to, trying to catch up with it? Samiran first and then Ashima and we can go around. I think I'll uh, take from Mr. McClay's point that right. it's now well understood that the share of capital has gone up so much over the last 40 years, and the share of labor has declined, right. means that the bargaining power of labor over time has come down. So that's why the wage growth has been significantly lower globally, despite output actually staying close to potential output. Right. And this is a very peculiar problem which breaks down what we economics normally take it as an axiom that there's a wage price spiral. Right. So then despite any commodity price shock, it does not get transmitted into a wage price spiral. Wage growth. And overall inflation stays low over a significant period of time. And that's why we are seeing this very peculiar phenomenon that in US, unemployment rate is at historical low, but they are barely getting 2% inflation. Right, right. And I think in India also, this is getting reflected in an odd way that earlier we used to say that food prices get very quickly generalized into core inflation because of wage bargaining power. Right. Whenever food prices would be up, you would ask for more wages, and that will just get generalized. But that's not happening anymore, because in India also, my sense is that the share of capital going up and labor's bargaining power coming down is breaking that channel through which typically we economists think of wage price balance. Right, break the channel. Uh, Indranil, have we really you know, won the war against inflation in that case? I think that you know, what you're seeing is low inflation because of low demand. And what you really want is, you know, uh, growth may be at a potential level. I mean, whatever that be, probably somewhere between 7 to 8 percent. Right. And, you know, you can live with inflation somewhere between around 5 to 6 percent. Uh, so what is really happening right now is you're seeing low inflation at the cost of growth. So that's number one. The second is that, you know, understanding inflation has also become, uh, you know, a statistical challenge because there's so many base effects. So inflation is going to now rise. It will probably call, crawl, you know, hit 5% next month. It will probably average around 4.5% for the next few months. Because last year, around this time, inflation fell to 2%. So uh, when, when you read inflation, I think it's very important uh, not to read it on a month-to-month -month basis, to see it over at least you know, a one-year span when you do monetary policy. So I think, uh, you know, in a way, the challenge for India is also to deflate and bring back growth rather than, you know, continue to depress inflation at sub-4%. 
right. levels. Right. Can I come in? Yeah, sure, now? please. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to distinguish between headline inflation and core inflation. So core inflation is what reflects the demand in the economy. That is very, very low. WPI inflation, which closer to producer prices, is, is 50 basis points, almost zero. Right. But uh, the earlier in India, I, Samiran's story about this wage price spiral, I think we are not that advanced. I think that labor has no bargaining power. But in India, the, the wage bargain was very closely associated with food inflation, especially in this 2007 period when we had sustained high food inflation above double digits for a number of years. Then you saw real wages begin to rise, agricultural real wages. But the spike we are seeing in inflation today, food after that food price inflation has been very, very low. So we are sensitive to oil and food inflation, which are part of headline. And that affects other prices, wages, and general inflation. But the oil economy has changed in the world because of shale and bargaining. We are not going to see sustained rise right. in oil prices. That right. is a positive right. for us. Then there is, I think, real productivity improvement in agriculture, which has kept food inflation lower. And the current spike is related to the floods. Vegetable and prices. Vegetable so. prices, very seasonal. So as a, as a monetary policy authority, you have to look through seasonal spikes which are not going to manifest in wages and general inflation. So even if headline inflation, which the central bank is targeting, goes up beyond four, but it's still less than their upper band of six, they have to look through it because core inflation is just 50 basis points and that is what is the real interest rate facing industry which is going through a, a slowdown, right? Right, right. So, so there, are, there are actually two, two major problems or issues for the RBI and for the government. One is that whether Dr. Surjit Bala, I think, has a paper on it uh, recently. Is uh, ultra-low inflation really good for India? Uh, if, if that is indeed the case, then what is it that they need to do? And, uh, or is inflation going to really come back? And is it just all that we've seen in the last one year is just a bit of a you know, base effect or some other, you know, low demand effect, which is really... No, that, that uh, was precisely in. the point I was making, that, right. you know, you will see headline C CPI inflation go up, but you have to see it in the context of the 2% base. So, you know, right now what has been happening is that uh, c CPI inflation has been 3.5 this year, 3.5 last year. Now what will happen is it will probably go to 4.5 to 5% this year versus 2% last year. So you got to take the average, which is 3.5% and way below, you know, uh, the, uh, I, I would say what, what is optimal for the economy. Right, right. Samiran, how do you see this issue playing forward in the next, say, six to eight months or so? Are we going to see inflation down on RBI? So, uh, you know, just a quick trivia is that if vegetable prices normalize, then it's a 120 basis point impact on inflation. So your headline will come down from 4.6 to 3.4 with nothing else moving. Uh, so that will give you a perspective on where inflation stands in a true sense of the term. Uh, but I think your broader question was that uh, should we start worrying less about inflation? Yes. Uh, I would differ from my rest of the panelists on this. I think we have taken a very strong stance that inflation will be our nominal anchor. We can't keep on changing the nominal anchor every few years. That will confuse policy making, confuse markets even more. Uh, we will have this healthy debate going on whether which is the right nominal anchor, whether it should be headline CPI, core CPI, WPI. Right. It will keep on going. But fact of life is that we have to stick with it for a significant period of time to get the benefit of, uh, okay. of that anchor. Yeah, and can I just come in yeah, on sure, this? Sure, of course, please. I, I, I think, Samiran, you, I, I, I agree with you that this uh, anchoring of inflation expectations is very important. The communication that inflation is going to average 4%. We've done some research at IGID which shows that it is affecting household, uh, you know, that, but it's the announcement effects that inflation targeting had is a short-term effect, but it's cyclical, structural, not it's structural sort of changes, the, the core inflation which matters more for the long term. So um, the inflation targeting which we've imposed at considerable pain should not be given up. And another issue, and, and, but that itself, that regime is giving us space to cut still. 
because it is a 4 to 6% right. range. And right. even with the spike in food prices, we are below that. And when growth is so much below potential, there is a weight to growth also. And core inflation is so low, there's still space to cut. The, your real or neutral interest rate is too high. But another sensitive issue in India is when you talk to bankers and so on, they are very, they, they say, they have, they have to worry about competition because they have to have higher to attract deposits. Now, people have avenues such as equity and mutual funds and so on, and they will go away when the, there's a sort of money illusion here. Savers are actually getting a real positive return. Earlier, they used to get 12% nominal return with 14% inflation, so it was actually a negative real return. But people think that, oh, I'm getting such so little money on my fixed deposits, and there is a concern, say, about senior citizens who need some absolute amounts to meet their budget and so on. So here, I think the point that came in the earlier session, in Europe, where, uh, in the, about the global monetary economy, where uh, in, real interest rates are negative, bankers are still paying a positive uh, rate of interest to household deposits. But they're charging firms negative interest rates, and firms need those liquidity services. So I think in India, one answer is to have differentiated interest rates, higher for, say, senior citizens. They're already high. They can be even... <laughs> <laughs> so, on the, on the While, so, you know, to meet this psychological sort of... and that Or taxes on bank deposits can be removed for certain categories, and they're competitive with equity. And So we need to think of this sort of issue also when we are... Uh, right. Uh, so on the issue of the inflation... Issue, we're moving to flexible. lower nominal rates and yeah, therefore yeah. lower interest rate. No, nom lower inflation and therefore lo lower nominal interest rate. So on the issue of the inflation ban, 4 to 6%, mm -hmm. you're not in favor of extending that ban or increasing that ban a little more. You're fine with where it is. Use, the, use the flexible inflation yeah. targeting. The it's word like, flexible, I think, and you And have, you have two years to, you know, where you can deviate from the ban without, so there should not be overreaction. I think in the early years of implementation, Central Bank has been too strict, too worried about meeting that ban. Right, okay. So we're going to be, we're running out of time. I just have time for one last set of questions. And I'll start with Jamal on this, because you started off by saying that you're the only non-economist here. So you, you're the man from the real world, so to say. Uh, so if you look at the future, if you were to ask you to gaze into a crystal ball and see the future where technology and digitization is going to play a huge, huge role, uh, what is the kind of role that you think a central bank should play when it, it, on, a, on a number of things, whether it is to do with bank management, markets? See, I, uh, frankly, you know, uh, I was thinking before this really about the global economy, India is clearly in a different picture, you know. Sure. I think, um, but I think the one thing that is, uh, uh, should apply in both cases, you know, historically, we used to say a central banker was someone who took away the punch bowl the right before the party started. <laughs> now, very clearly, globally, what's happened is they have been the bootleggers. They have right. been delivering the booze, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So I think that principle should remain in India, right? Now, there may be differences of opinion as to uh, is, when the party starts or where the party is right, right now. And I also feel really the point I raised earlier and I mentioned again, is that we're focusing really on monetary policy and the central bank, but you can't do that sort of in a vacuum. I mean, the government, fiscal policy, sentiment, I mean, all of it is one part, you can't play you, know, you can't play this musical instrument alone. Right, right. Antonil, your views? I think that, you know, in India, you have this uh, 1881 uh, Negotiable Instruments Act, which says that uh, all transactions must happen through the banking system and, and the RBI. So as long as that act stands, you know, you could have more and more of financial innovations, but they would still go through the banking system. So uh, I, I don't see much changing in India at least, you know, in the next 10 years, unless you are really talking of scrapping that act. Right, okay. So, Miran, how should monetary policy, you think, evolve to uh, face the challenges of the new world? I think I'll go back to where Dr. Acharya started from. I think the role of central banks in maintaining financial stability, I think that's going to get more precedence over time because as people realize that the technology, et cetera, is the supply side boost to long-term growth. So growth is going to come from there. Right. Central banks' ability to spar that growth will become increasingly less relevant. Right. And central bank will be left with the job of 
maintaining financial stability and right. supporting that growth. Right. That's an interesting point. Uh, Ashima, do you, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think as we move to being a mature economy and we have low stable inflation and high growth, then, uh, but internationally also there's a huge focus on macro prudential tools for, for financial stability. So one of the issues in India has been the central bank is, is the regulator of the banking system now of NBFCs also. Right. So you have to, financial stability can mean both uh, liquidity in bad times counter-cyclical macro-prudential regulation. They should not be pro-cyclical. So you take away that punch bowl from the financial sector when they're partying, it's boom, <laughs> euphoria. But you provide them support when they are uh, when, they are, when they are in uh, so tough times. So which... you need to move towards counter-cyclicality in macro-prudential regulation. And that should coordinate with monetary policy. And monetary policy must, and fiscal policy must coordinate. I think another mistake we made was we took autonomy to mean they don't talk to each other. You know, with Viral, you get the view that the government is the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the case. They are both our agents, and they have to run the economy so that all of us benefit. And they need to talk to each other. If the government is taking measures which are keeping inflation low from the supply side, the Reserve Bank must has room, space to accommodate. Right, right. We saw how that really played out last year. But uh, thanks, Ashima, on that very hopeful note. We will end this panel discussion here today. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, Indranil. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you, Samiran. It's been a great discussion and some very incisive, very insightful points. Dr. Acharya also joined us uh, briefly. And I hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, there's much, much more discussion and really high quality stuff to look forward to. So please stay out here and enjoy, enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.